Well, I want to be respectful of everybody's time today, so we'll just get started and kick right into it. My name is Elizabeth Soja, and I'm with um, the Gateway and Natural Amenity Region Initiative, or the NAR Initiative. Um, we're an extension program out of Utah State University and the Institute of Outdoor Recreation and Tourism, and we're excited to partner with Project 7B for this Planning 101 webinar today. Um, just so everyone knows, uh, we're going to ask you a few questions over the chat throughout the session today. Um, the session is being recorded as well. We will share the recording along with key takeaways to everyone who registered um, after the fact. So no worries if there's a nugget that you'd like to circle back to later, um, you will definitely have a chance. Um, we will. Uh, we, we have the Q&A and the chat open. So if you'd like to ask questions, we'd prefer you put your questions in the Q&A so we can make sure to ask them to the panelists at the end, um, as many as possible. Uh, we will also be monitoring the chat for questions, but if you can put the questions in the Q&A, we'll make sure that they don't get missed. Um, when you do answer via chat, if you can make sure your chat is going to um, everyone, not just the hosts and the panelists, that way we can all try and engage with each other in this weird Zoom world that we live in. So with that, I hope you all uh, enjoy the presentation and I'm going to pass it off to Susan. Hi, thank you, Elizabeth. Um, I'm Susan Drumheller and I am on the board of Project 7B and uh, we are thrilled to be partnering with the Gateway and Natural Amenity Region Initiative on uh, putting together this webinar. Uh, one reason we did this was because, um, as many of you probably know, uh, Bonner County is about to launch into an update of its comprehensive land use plan. And I believe the city of Sandpoint is getting ready to do the same thing. And uh, land use planning is super important. And um, we basically formed to try to get people um, to understand land use planning better and to be more involved because it does have such a big impact on our community and um, our quality of life. So we hope that you find this to be valuable. Um, another uh, project that we worked on in an effort to try to help people get up to speed on land use planning and development issues in Bonner County was our Bonner County story map. We got funding from Union Pacific Foundation and the uh, <clears throat> Equinox Foundation to put that together. And that is available on our website. Um, and uh, one thing that's going to be, uh, I think she mentioned that we're gonna have some questions and, and uh, uh, in the chat for you. And the first one uh, that's going to be posted is what changes have you noticed in Bonner County over the last five to 10 years? So um, you can put your answers in the chat box. Um, one thing I want to point out before I introduce our, our panelists today is uh, people have asked us before why we have worked so much with the University of Utah um, and they are, you know, a partner in the Gateway Natural Amenity Region Initiative. Um, and, and that is because they are the only accredited planning program in the Intermountain West. And also um, one of their professors, Dr. Donya Ramori, who's also one of the founders of the Gateway Natural Amenity Region Initiative, is from Sandpoint. Um, she has deep ties to this area and she cares about um, Sandpoint a lot. So um, it's been a great partnership with their program. Um, so I would like to introduce our panelists. We're thrilled to have with us today, Leanne Bernstein. She is the uh, planning and zoning administrator for the city of Driggs, Idaho. And they are another, um, what we call a NAR community, a, a community that's being impacted a lot by uh, intense growth because of the great um, natural amenities we have in our areas. And uh, they recently underwent a comprehensive land use plan update as well. So we're gonna learn from her about that. Leanne holds a Bachelor's of Environmental Studies and a Master's of City and Metropolitan Planning and is, uh, has a graduate certificate in ur urban design. 
Uh, we also are honored and pleased to have G Jordan Catcher here with us today. And uh, she's a community development specialist with Utah Community Development Office. And she's an associate instructor in the University of Utah's Department of City and Metropolitan Planning. And she's also currently leading the grassroots initiative known as the Utah Rural Coordinating Council, which includes members from 30, more than 30 state, federal agencies, universities, and organizations. And they are working to enhance the communication with one another and, and better serve rural Utah. So I think we um, hopefully will learn a lot today. I think this is gonna be pretty, um, uh, just give people the fundamentals and, and hopefully help better prepare all of us to engage and participate in the comprehensive land use updates that are happening in our communities. Thanks. Oh, and now I'm gonna hand it off to Jordan. Thank you so much, Susan. And hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here with us today. We're very excited. I'm gonna screen share for my presentation. So welcome, I have been asked to prepare a Planning 101 um, webinar for you all today and I'm very excited. Um, my name, like I said, is Jordan Catcher and today I'm going to be going over a couple of things with you all. Um, I'm actually going to go over a little bit of the history of planning, uh, talk about what a comprehensive plan actually is, and then also discuss how to update the plan as well as how to enact the plan too. Um, and just like Susan had mentioned, um, I am an associate instructor at the University of Utah and also a community development specialist for the state. And we wanted to throw a question into the chat before I kind of get into the presentation. So when you hear the phrase comprehensive plan, what comes to mind for you? I would love to, um, to see what comes up there. I'll give you all a moment just to throw in your responses into the chat. The plan to follow moving forward, absolutely. Far reaching, future view, wonderful. Yes, guided community development. So really thinking in the future, sprawl. So open country vistas interrupted by track homes. Okay, so yeah, thinking about like where is development, where are things going, uh, responsible planning for growth, a guide for future land use. Wonderful, this is great. There's already a wonderful baseline here, uh, which is really phenomenal. So that's wonderful to see. Um, so I, I wanted to actually, when I was putting together this, this presentation, I really wanted to encapsulate like what is planning? How did it come to be? Um, why does it exist? And how is, does it exist the way that it does? Um, and I wanted to throw in this quote uh, that failing to plan is planning to fail. Um, and really the idea behind that is that uh, it's super important to think about where we wanna go, both as ourselves as individuals, but also as a community and as a region. Um, and we're able to take the time to actually think about who are we? Who do we wanna become? What do we wanna preserve? Who do we wanna be, et cetera? Those are things that are very vital to a planning process. Um, and so I wanted to start out by actually going over the history of planning. I'm not gonna go over like all the details of it, um, but I think that it's really beautiful to, to paint a picture of what has been the history of planning in our country and sort of how did we evolve into even creating comprehensive plans to begin with. Um, so I'm actually going to go all the way back to 1901, <laughs> uh, so bear with me a little bit, um, but if we go all the way back over 100 years ago, um, there was the New York Tenement House Law that was enacted in 1901, and that was a housing reform law that was aimed at improving living conditions in New York's tenement buildings, so any building that housed three or more families. Uh, and basically, this law set requirements for new buildings to improve their light and air quality for residents, uh, to have an open courtyard, to have improved ventilation, indoor toilets, and better fire safety. Basically, what was happening is as the United States was developing and people were moving more towards cities, uh, and there was development and housing, et cetera, they had realized that over the years, they were like, oh, wait a minute, maybe it's not so safe with the way that these houses and buildings are being designed. Maybe we should have some sort of regulation so that there are um, safety measures in place for people that are living there. What's the responsibility involved with that? And so the New York Tenement House Law really kind of started to introduce that concept into the United States. And then um, as cities started evolving and growing, there was sort of this formation of an early city planning commission. So this was in 1902, 
So Cleveland's chapter of the Architectural Institute of America and then their city's chamber of commerce, they put together a bill to form a board of city planning for Ohio cities. So former Ohio governor George Nash fulfilled that bill by appointing several individuals to sort of form this group plan commission for Cleveland. So it wasn't, um, it wasn't technically a city planning commission, but the group really acted like one. So all of a sudden they were just starting to think about, well, we've got these cities that are growing. Maybe we should talk about it. Maybe we should start to have some um, idea of how they're developing and growing. And then we were able to see our first official city planning commission actually evolve in 1907. So a planning commission makes recommendations about the planning and zoning of a city or town to the local council. Um, you can also have county commissions as well. Uh, and Hartford, Connecticut actually became the first city in the US with an official and permanent city planning commission. So before 1907, a lot of planning commissions would kind of get together and create a plan and then they would disband. So they weren't always there for the long run. They just kind of came in, did the work and sort of left. Um, and that was the structure. And it really wasn't until 1907 that you really started to have an established structure start to become. Then we start segueing into zoning. So in 1913, uh, legislatures in New York, Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Illinois separately allowed some cities to create residential districts where no manufacturing or commercial establishments could operate. The reason for this is because what was happening is factories were being built and homes were being built right next door. Uh, so when we think about the exhaust from some of these factories, just the health and safety concerns, et cetera, they'd realize maybe it's not a great idea to build homes right up against the factory. Maybe we should start to think about how we're actually separating land. That way we can have different uses, but people, um, their health isn't jeopardized by where they're living um, within their community. So we actually saw our first municipally employed planner um, in 1914. So Harlan Bartholomew became the first full-time public sector city planner in the United States. Uh, and he was hired by Newark, New Jersey. Um, I actually, just as a little side note, I actually didn't know about planning as a profession until I actually joined my graduate program. Um, I have lived in a bunch of different states. I had the pleasure of also living in Coeur d'Alene for a time. Um, and I didn't know that you could be involved in local government. I didn't know that there were people that worked as planners that helped to uh, put together cities and towns and regions and really think about what they look like um, and how they're evolving. And so it's really wonderful to see that it's been a little over a hundred years since the first city planner was actually um, established in the United States. So as time sort of started to go on in the 1920s, we started to see the shift. So we started to see a majority of Americans starting to live more in urban environments. So, and it became over, you know, half of that population moving there. And so all of a sudden you just see a lot of rapid growth in these cities. Um, and so the need for planning was elevated even more so. Um, so there were two pretty large acts in the twenties that really significantly kind of altered and changed planning for the US. The first was the Standard State Zoning Enabling Act in 1922. So the U.S. Department of Commerce Committee issued the third draft of this act, which would help states create a zoning restrictions in their jurisdictions. And this draft contained important language, which really defined what a zoning commission was and called for a plan for zoning regulations. And then following that in 1927, a standard city planning enabling act helped states understand um, the organization and powers of city and regional planning commissions, the making of city and regional plans, um, and really controlling the layout of new subdivisions. So really the 20s was a time where they were like, all right, like <laughs> there's a lot of growth happening and shift and people are happening to, you know, shifting over to, to cities and to larger environments. So we really need to think about how are we gonna um, accommodate all these different uses and all these different users in the same area. So we actually didn't see our first comprehensive plan until 1925, uh, where Cincinnati became the first American city to have a comprehensive plan, both approved and adopted into law by city council. Um, so that was in 1925. And then in 1933, there was a national planning board, which was established under the authority of public works. So this board really worked to promote the idea of planning public works and pushing for more comprehensive regional plans. Um, and so this was really starting to see a shift here. And you can see Idaho here um, had a consultant from the National Planning Board. Um, this was in 1934, which was really cool to see um, on here as well. 
And then, so I just mentioned, you know, the 20s was where we were starting to see a lot of growth in the city. But then what ended up happening is we started to see a lot of sprawl. So in the 1940s, for the first time, the U.S. Census is showing more population growth in suburbs rather than in the central cities, right? So all of a sudden, there's starting to be the sprawl. People are not necessarily wanting to be in that dense um, sort of city environment, but wanting to have a little bit more space with yards, single family homes, et cetera. And coinciding with that was really the Federal Aid Highway Act of 1956. So President Dwight Eisenhower signed the Federal Aid um, Highway Act into law, and the plan was to fund 41,000 miles of interstate highways over a period of 10 years. And it was a really good deal for states because um, under the act, 90% of construction costs came from the Highway Trust Fund. So states only had to pay 10% um, to be able to fund the highway systems in their states. And this act really contributed to an increase in driving by Americans, as well as the growth of suburbs and the decline of cities, right? So we have an established um, highway system. We're starting to see more sprawl and more suburbs that are happening. Um, and through that, there was sort of concern about, well, how do we preserve things? Um, how far is too far with sprawl? So actually in 1958, um, there was the first urban growth boundary established. So an urban growth boundary is intended to prevent urban sprawl into agricultural and rural land. So actually Lexington, Kentucky became the first city to enact an urban growth boundary, um, which would really limit new development to specific areas of their city. So in Lexington, the goal was to protect bluegrass and horse farms that are considered part of the city's identity. So the residents of Lexington were like, what makes Lexington special? And how can we accommodate this growth while also preserving um, the Kentucky bluegrass and the horse farms, et cetera? That way they can coincide and live together too. Uh, then we kind of segue over to the National Historic Preservation Act, which um, was really monumental, especially for rural communities. Um, this was signed to protect historic sites from development. So as we're seeing a lot of growth and change, et cetera, they were like, well, wait a minute, we have these beautiful structures and buildings that we want to preserve for the long term. So let's make sure that that's a priority. Um, and so through this, um, it established the National Register of Historic Places. Um, if you've ever been to different sites and you see those plaques on the buildings uh, and also the National Historic Landmark programs. So many communities now consider historic preservation um, as, as a standalone in their comprehensive plans or as part of a larger comprehensive plan. Um, it's just super important to be able to preserve those buildings and that history. So I'm almost at the tail end of my history lesson, um, but really all of this comes all the way to a really important program that really transformed planning for rural as well as regional governments. And this is the Comprehensive Planning Assistance 701 program. It actually was enacted through the Housing Act of 1954 um, and was originally targeted for small local governments. So as we saw a lot of support for cities, right? They're growing so quickly, they're starting to hire planners, they're starting to make their comprehensive plans. Um, after several decades, they were like, wait a minute, what about small towns? What about regional areas? Um, they need to plan just the same. So the funding from the 701 program really enabled regional and smaller governments to hire planners and to create their own comprehensive plans. And this was huge. This provided a huge amount of funding. Um, and a lot of these plans were kind of enacted in the 70s. That was like sort of a, a renaissance of planning um, for a lot of regional governments throughout the U.S. And it goes to show that Bonner County um, created their first comprehensive plan in 1978, right? So right along that time as a 701 program, which disbanded in uh, 1981, but then um, since seeing the importance of planning, a lot of regional governments have created their own internal capacity to, um, to take on planning from there on out. So, okay, so I just gave you a rundown of <laughs> planning history throughout the last hundred years and how long was that? 10 minutes, which was pretty impressive. Um, so now we're going to segue to, okay, so that's the whole history of planning. That's why it exists, et cetera. So what exactly is the comprehensive plan then? Um, and specifically the comprehensive plan for Bonner County. So with Idaho law, so every state really um, determines what the requirements are for planning. Um, it's a whole spectrum. Uh, Oregon, for instance, has 19 statewide planning goals. Uh, Utah, for instance, just has, we just actually added water. So we have three um, required or four required elements in our plans. We call them general plans in Utah. Um, but Idaho calls them comprehensive plans. Um, and they actually have a law. It's the Idaho's Local Land Use Planning Act, which was enabled um, in 1975. And this code requires cities and counties to prepare, implement, review, and update their comprehensive plans for their jurisdictions. 
Um, and those plans are supposed to consider the previous and existing conditions, right? So what's the history of this area, the trends, what are they starting to see that's kind of bubbling, those desirable goals and objectives, what do they want to preserve, who do they want to become, um, and their desirable future situations uh, for an established list of land use components. So this is a really important topic. Uh, because even if you're not working in planning, you're living in those environments, right? And so trying to figure out how to establish a plan that really accurately depicts where you've been, where you are, and where you're going is super, super vital. The plan really is meant to identify the goals and policies to guide development, preserve, and build upon that unique sense of community, right? What makes Bonner County different? Uh, and then also developing a future land use map that really outlines a general pla um, plan for development, preservation, and land use. So what that means is we look at what, um, what are the uses of that land right currently and where do we wanna move in the future, right? When I was talking about earlier, it's like when they used to build factories right next to houses, that wasn't exactly working. And so they had to assess and figure out how do we accommodate all these different uses in a way that works for everyone and also helps to make sure that everyone's safe and healthy too. So in these comprehensive plans, um, they either have to address or provide justification for omitting the following topics. So there are a list um, that I've put here um, that have property rights, population, school facilities and transportation, economic development, land use, natural resources, hazardous areas, public services, facilities and utilities, transportation, recreation, special areas or sites, housing, community design, agriculture, implementation, national interest, electric transmission corridors, as well as public airport facilities. Um, so basically Idaho was like, here is what we think should be in your comprehensive plan. And those are the topics that you'll kind of work under. Um, now, could you add additional topics? Absolutely. Um, some communities do, some communities don't. And it really kind of depends on um, where they're at and what their priorities are. But that's sort of the, the baseline requirement for all of those cities and counties throughout the state. So why, why do we even need a comprehensive plan? Um, it's really incredible to provide long-term direction. So we can't predict the future as much as it would be really nice if we could. Um, I'm sure a lot of us didn't really anticipate the pandemic or how that shifted our lives. So um, we, can, we can plan to a fault, but we don't actually know what's around the corner. Um, but by taking the time to really think about, well, what are those trends? What are we seeing? What are our concerns? Um, that really helps to kind of provide that sort of long-term visioning structure that a lot of you mentioned when we asked, like, what is a comprehensive plan? Um, it's super, super vital to have that long-term vision, and it can really help decision makers. So what happens is when developers come in or there's opportunities for change, et cetera, within those boundaries, decision makers can look at that comprehensive plan and say, actually, like that doesn't really align with our comprehensive plan. So would you mind altering this so that it would meet the needs of our community? It's just kind of this like... Um, it's a way to touch base with the community and figure out and make sure that the changes and um, things that are happening in that area are aligned with what the community is looking for. It also communicates those values and goals and priorities of your community. And it really seeks to preserve like what makes your community special. Like you live there, right? So hopefully it's a place that you really wanna be at. Bonner County is one of the most beautiful places I've ever been to. And having lived in 10 states, I feel like I've hopped around a lot. Um, so you all live in a very gorgeous, gorgeous part of the state. Um, and so you want to be able to preserve that, right, for yourselves, for future generations, et cetera. An effective comprehensive plan really describes that community vision, which when we say community vision, that's a hard thing to do. Um, I'm sure most of you know that, you know, whether it's, um, you know, people in your neighborhood or people in your city or people in your county, not everyone is going to think the same way, but it's super, super vital to be able to figure out what are the thoughts and desires of everyone and how can we craft a vision that is encompassing um, of all of those different desires and wants as well as achieving, you know, identities, uh, identifies how to achieve that vision. So, you know, it's not only like, okay, we wanna be a, um, you know, say there was a community that wanted to really preserve their agriculture. If they were like, we wanna be an agricultural community. Well, then how do we make that happen? Or how do we help preserve that, right? So the plan would help you identify how to achieve that vision. And it would also set goals with strategies and deliberate actions to make that happen. And typically comprehensive plans are updated every five to 15 years, really depending on the nature of the community and those needs. 
So also for an effective comprehensive plan, um, it influences other policy documents. So that's what's really cool about it too, is that it's not just its own standalone, it's really supposed to be used for other documents, such as your budget, right? What they're putting money towards. So if in the plan it says that they wanna you know, prioritize X, Y, and Z, then that budget should really match that. Same with the ordinances. So your ordinances are your local laws that are telling you what you can and cannot do. So those ordinances should really align with that plan, right? That way there's a matching there. And then zoning, which I'll talk about in a moment, um, zoning is actually just the, the, um, the designation of uses throughout your community. And so what I was talking about earlier about having different um, uses in different areas, making sure that those uses are aligned with what the community is looking for and what they need. Uh, it should also provide direction for those tough decisions. Like I said, not everyone's always going to be on the same page, um, but if there's a thorough public involvement process and um, it's really intentional and open, I can really help with those tough decisions um, moving forward. And then it just improves the community too um, and improves that trust. It's also super important to mention that the plan is a living document. Uh, writing a plan is just the beginning. So you don't necessarily go through the process and write it and say, okay, perfect, it's done. We don't have to do it for another 10, 15 years. Um, it's actually, once it's written is when you start to do actually the work. So for a little bit of a visual, so what happens is a comprehensive plan is created. And in that plan, you start to designate your future land use map, right? So what that means is you're looking at your map and you're saying, okay, these are the uses that are currently happening. We think that we wanna preserve this area and that area it looks like there's this asset here, et cetera. So it's a whole process of the community coming together and saying, these are the things we wanna protect. These are the areas we wanna develop in, et cetera. And then how that's reflected is through your zoning. So your zoning is really where the rubber meets the road. Your comprehensive plan provides that vision and that idea, but the zoning is really where it actually happens uh, because the zoning regulates what you can and cannot do in certain areas of your community. Um, and it's, it's just a super wonderful pairing, right? Um, because that way, when you go through a really thorough public involvement process in your comprehensive plan update, um, it really is reflected in the zoning. Um, and that is a really nice pairing to have because it's important to have the vision alongside what is actually enacted and what people can actually do. Um, and sometimes things shift. So when you're looking at your future land use map, you might say, um, okay, it looks like you know this area could deal with a little bit more growth and this area is kind of having too much growth. So how do we um, separate, et cetera? And I'm sure you all probably know that it's, it's all different uh, spectrum of what people prefer, right? Um, some people wanting to have um, a little bit more land base, other places wanting to have a little bit more um, housing variety, et cetera. It's a whole big spectrum. But when you can look at your entire land base and see, okay, these are all the needs that we have. This is what our community wants. And we're going to create a zoning map that really reflects that. That way, when we have future development or future uh, growth, it is really reflected in our zoning map and with our, our plan as well. It's also really important, I heard that it was mentioned that uh, Sandpoint may actually be updating their um, comprehensive plan as well. Actually, um, I put my little Pack River, uh, Pack River uh, mug with me today with my coffee. Um, but uh, it is important for uh, there to be a relationship between city and county governments, right? So your county has all the unincorporated land and then your cities are all the municipalities with their own incorporated boundaries. And so, but they're, related they're right next to each other right you've got boundaries but like you don't see them when you're walking around and so it's super important for cities and counties to work together to think about okay um it looks like you know sandpoint might have a little bit more density here um so maybe we'll you know work with them in this area maybe priest river will go over this etc and really thinking about um what is the growth and what are the impacts throughout this whole entire county um, and how can we work together to really meet the needs of our community residents and really um, reflect the trends that are being shown too. So after you um, have basically put together, you know, figured out what your comprehensive plan is, um, it's time to update it. So I wanted to talk a little bit about how to update a comprehensive plan as well as how to enact that plan too once it's updated. Basically, more or less to kind of simplify it, there's kind of just three stages to a comprehensive plan uh, process. So the first is really to gather your data and that community input um, for what they want to see in the future. Uh, and then stage two is really drafting and reviewing that plan. Um, and then stage three is adopting and carrying the plan out, right? Like actually doing the work um, and putting forth those changes. So in updating the comprehensive plan, 
the process can really help address the priorities for community challenges specifically. So some challenges that we notice a lot with gateway communities are affordable housing, right? Growth pressure, tourism. Um, you're in a very beautiful place. And so a lot of people have, you know, are drawn to that area. And so when you have those growth pressures, um, how do you accommodate the challenges that are coming along with that, right? Um, it's hard, it's shifting, right? There's uh, more people, it, it's a different dynamic, et cetera. You wanna preserve things. Um, so that's what makes updating the conference of plan even more important is to make sure to um, take into account all of those thoughts and perspectives. Also in updating the plan, it can really help to increase transparency and openness between the government and residents. Um, there's a lot we don't know. Like if you're not involved in government, you might not know what those processes are, right? Um, like I said before, I had no idea about local government. I didn't know how it worked. I didn't know the structure. I didn't know the requirements, et cetera. Um, but I feel like the more that we're able to know about these processes, the more that we're able to just um, learn from each other, the easier it is to understand each other and understand the constraints that we're under. Um, but you know, with governments in general, it's like the more open that they can be um, in that process is, is the most beneficial for the residents to build trust in them. And also providing ample opportunities for residents to share their thoughts and recommendations is huge too. Um, people should be able to be heard. And so whether that's through um, you know, a, a city or a county hosting an open house or doing surveys or workshops, et cetera, really thinking about how they're going to engage with the community and really hear from them is super vital because that's what's informing the plan. Typically, like I mentioned, it's recommended that comprehensive plans be updated between five and 15 years, depending on the nature of the community. If you're a community that's like really rapidly growing and expanding, you're gonna update that more often versus a community that, you know, in Utah, we actually have some communities that are actually shrinking. Um, they're actually not growing at all. And so um, there are different constraints depending on the type of community that you are. Um, cities and counties can update their plans either in-house or through a consulting firm. So if cities and counties update their plans in-house, typically they have dedicated planner staff and a really active planning commission um, that will oversee that process. Otherwise, um, sometimes when cities and counties, if they have low staff capacity or they're just pretty large, um, they may decide to update that plan by contracting with a consulting firm that will oversee that update. And that's where they would pay for those services. So which approach is better? in-house or with a consultant, it really depends on the needs of the community. Um, but what's most important is that this process involves the community as much as possible so that the comprehensive plan can accurately reflect the needs and desires of the residents that live there. And public engagement is really the foundation to the comprehensive planning process. Um, and if you wanna be involved, reach out to county staff and elected leaders to understand how they plan on hearing from the public in this process. Um, trying to figure out, you know, are they going to be updating through a newsletter or through their website, or what's their timeline for completion? Are they doing it in-house? Are they working with um, a consulting firm? What does it actually look like? Um, and being able to be involved in that process is super vital. How long does it take to update a comprehensive plan? It really depends. So typically we see that in-house plans tend to take a little bit longer, whereas working with consultants can sometimes elevate that process. But typically, comprehensive plan updates can take anywhere from six months to up to two years to update. Uh, sometimes they'll take different chunks of it, right? So I mentioned all those different elements. Um, so sometimes they may just end up updating certain sections of the comprehensive plan over the years, or they may all decide to do it all together. Um, they may have a lot of staff working on it. They may not. It really depends on so many different factors. But around six months to two years is kind of that ideal timeline. And then lastly, how to enact the plan. So after that comprehensive plan has been updated, it has to go through an approval and an adoption process. So for cities that update their plans, their city council would adopt that plan. And then for counties, their county commission would adopt that plan as well. And just to reiterate too, effective comprehensive plans are ones that really identify goals and objectives, but more specifically identify who's responsible for these things and what is the timeline for completion, right? You can make a beautiful document that says like, we wanna do this and that and this, et cetera, but who is gonna do that? And when are they going to do that? That's what actually gets the momentum going. Otherwise, we tend to see that sometimes these plans kind of sit on a shelf and they're not really used that often. But really, if they're intentionally updated in ways that really outline who's going to do what and when, that could really elevate um, uh, just the impact that these plans can have on a community. And like I mentioned, once the plan's adopted, that's when it's time to get to work. So uh, this living document really outlines the roadmap for the community moving forward and serves as a foundation for future land use decisions. 
So um, with that, I just wanted, I know I just bowled up through a lot of information. I really hope um, that some of this was new information for you. And I just wanted to say, thank you so much for participating in this webinar and just for being active in your local community and just wanting to be involved. Um, it just warms my heart anytime uh, somebody has interest in, in their local government and um, because you care and that's beautiful. So thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Jordan. Uh, 100 years of history in like four and a half minutes. That was so impressive. My fastest history lesson ever. So um, to transition from Jordan over to Leanne from Driggs, Idaho, um, you know, so Leanne is from a small town in Idaho, obviously. And so I just wanted to throw this prompt out to you guys in the audience. Um, when you think of a rural community in Idaho, um, like what do you see? What are the features that it has? Um, I Obviously you all really um, love the rural community in Bonner County. And that's probably, you know, part of the reason you're even here today in the middle of the day on a Thursday. And, you know, that's what I know Leanne can speak to Driggs. That's what they their residents really appreciate as well. Um, and so, yeah, if you guys, want to make any comments in the chat, that would be great. Um, but even just thinking about it while Leanne's talking about like what Drake's went through during their recent comprehensive plan update. Um, make sure, awesome. Well, Leanne, I'm just gonna pass it off to you. Uh, Jonna, the dark skies, I agree. I like that about rural areas as well. Great, thank you, Elizabeth. Can, can you hear me all right? Yep. Perfect. All right. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you all from a fellow Idaho NAR community. Um, what I would really like to do is kind of make some of uh, the connections between what Jordan has spoken about, kind of the overall framework of planning and the comprehensive plan and how we use that in our community um, and share with you kind of my experience in DRIGS uh, with updating a comprehensive plan and implementing it. Um, and so to kind of bring bring things down to a to a good example, um, got some you know advice, some pros and cons and some different ways to look at it. And again, just kind of getting a good understanding of what this means for a, you know, a small rural community, especially in our community in Idaho. Um, so as a little bit of a background, um, I am the planning and zoning administrator here with the city of Driggs. Um, so I am the essentially the department director for uh, both planning and zoning and also the building department here. Um, as kind of a side note, I am also the um, interim contract planning administrator for Teton County, which is the county that Driggs is in. Um, and that's kind of a bigger story, uh, but essentially um, the planning profession is pretty tough these days. It's hard to get really good qualified planners. The county was really short staffed, so I stepped in to help them out a little bit. Um, but with that, I am a contract planner with them. I do not represent Teton County. Um, I represent the city of Driggs. Um, but I do plan to kind of bring some of the things that I've learned from kind of being in that role, being in both ro roles a little bit um, and bringing what I've learned um, in both of these, both of these positions um, here to share with you all. Um, so I will uh, share my screen real quick, just so you don't have to um, look at my face too much <laughs> while I'm talking. I don't have a beautiful presentation like Jordan did. Um, but I can share with you some, some things. Um, here is our uh, zoning map, and I'll actually just kind of zoom out a little bit to uh, um, just an aerial of Driggs and Teton County um, to give you a little bit of perspective if you're not familiar with the area. Um, so this is uh, Teton County, Idaho. Um, it just kind of disappeared, but uh, here is Driggs if you zoom in a little bit. Uh, we are on the western side of the Tetons. Um, from Driggs, we're about a 45 minute or two hour drive from Jackson, depending on what the traffic is looking like at the time. Um, the city of Driggs is more or less in the center of Teton County. As you can kind of see, there's two other cities in the county with us, Tetonia to the north um, and Victor down here to the south. Um, the city of Driggs is kind of the, the hub of 
the uh, of Teton County. We've got the grocery store, <laughs> we've got um, kind of the bigger commercial district, and um, more or less if you're driving through Teton County, you're going to have to drive through Driggs at some point. Um, so we've got a lot of stuff going on, a great mix of uses, and if, you know, if I do say so myself, a, a beautiful, vibrant uh, downtown, although it is pretty, pretty small. We've got one stoplight. Um, so getting into the comprehensive plan topic, um, we, the City of Driggs updated our comprehensive plan. We adopted it in November 2020. Um, and that was after kind of a process. So uh, the previous comprehensive plan um, was adopted in 2007. Uh, there was a couple kind of minor amendments throughout that time, um, but uh, it starting around 2017, so about 10 years after that, a little bit sooner, um, the planners at the time, which this was before my time, I started here in 2019, um, around 2017, um, the planning administrator at the time uh, wanted to initiate a, a comp plan update. Um, and the, the plan and the hope was to um, do this in-house. Um, there was uh, kind of three, functionally three staff planners um, working for the city at that time. Um, so they kind of started in on that process. And, and again, I, I wasn't here, so I don't want to speak too much um, of what exactly that looked like. Um, but from what I understand it, um, they started to get going and, you know, the, the demand on planners is pretty high. There's always things that are going on. There's always applications that are coming in um, and they just, they weren't able to have um, the capacity uh, that they uh, needed to really get this going. Um, so that was around 2016, 2017. Um, shortly after that, the, we kind of figured, okay, we need, we need a little bit of help. Um, so they were able to budget in the, our fiscal year for 2019 um, enough money to, well, uh, enough money uh, to help support the city working with an outside consultant. Um, we ended up working with Logan Simpson. Um, and the funding for that came, it was split between, um, again, just kind of making the budget for it and the city budget for that fiscal year. Um, and we were also awarded a grant from the uh, Blue Cross of Idaho Foundation. Um, so they were able to, to help us cover the, the costs of that consultant. Um, on, just on a note for the Blue Cross of Idaho Foundation, this is a grants program that still um, goes on. I'm not sure what their application cycle is, but it is a program that they're still doing that is specifically focused on um, helping communities update their comprehensive plans. Um, they were otherwise not involved in the, in the project of updating the plan. Their only requirement is that we, uh, which, which is a great requirement that we focus um, at some, in some capacity on community health. So uh, looking at the slide that Jordan shared about all of the topics that a comprehensive plan has to cover, I mean, you can tie pretty much every single one of those to community health. You know, if we're looking at transportation, that has health implications. Um, if we're looking at open space, that has health implications. If we're looking at kind of commercial and economic development, that all has health implications. The built environment, has so many implications for health. So it was um, so easy <laughs> and actually just a really great way to kind of weave our comprehensive plan together um, with, this, with this focus on health. And I'll bring up the comprehensive plan in a little bit and kind of show you exactly how we did that. But um, that, was, that was their only requirement. Otherwise they were, they were hands off and we were able to do our thing. So in 2019, we kind of started in earnest with the uh, with working with the consultants to update this plan, um, and that was this is pretty much right when I came on board with the city, uh, 2019. So I really hit the ground running here. Um, uh, yeah, with my experience with working with the consultants, um, we they were able to kind of do the do the work. So if you, I kind of imagined us um, like, you know, being on a boat, they were the, the steam engine on the boat and the city was, was steering the ship and kind of giving direction on where to go. Whereas the consultant was kind of able to, okay, go back, do the work, do the drafting, 
um, we were able to direct them in how to do that, review everything that they did and say, no, this isn't quite right, or uh, yes, we need to go further in this direction because that's what's right for DRIGS. Um, and they were totally receptive to that. Um, and they did provide some kind of bigger outside perspective about um, comprehensive plans in general, you know, for the team that we were working on. Um, they, that's what they focus on. That's what they're doing. So they know comprehensive plans. They know how it works. They were able to give us um, fantastic advice as to um, the formatting and really making sure that how it's organized and, and everything that we cover is useful. Um, but then the content and the vision that's in it was left up to the city of Driggs. So again, that was spring of 2019 that we really started with them. Um, a couple of big pieces of the process that I wanna to touch on. Um, one of the first steps is that we convened a comprehensive plan committee. Um, so it was a committee of seven volunteers um, that we solicited from the community. We tried to kind of get, you know, get everyone involved, get a big, big range of people, lots of people with different perspectives. Um, and we convened this, this committee. And these were the folks that were um, really focused on the, the ins and outs of the plan. We met uh, for a while, once a month, and then occasion when we got kind of down to it and we're getting closer to a final draft, uh, they were meeting a little bit more frequently. They were the ones that were reading every single sentence of this plan and providing feedback, getting together and kind of talking through some of the questions, um, some of the bigger bigger topics, smaller topics, um, and kind of getting to a place where, where it felt right for the city of Driggs. So where I, when I say that the city was steering the ship, um, I mean, you know, staff and elected officials, absolutely, but the comprehensive plan committee, totally steering the ship um, and, you know, representing their perspectives and the perspectives of their, you know, kind of smaller communities within the larger uh, city of Driggs community. Um, so the uh, comp plan process involved a range of uh, community engagement efforts. Um, the first big step uh, that the consultant undertook was um, kind of a collecting of existing conditions data, uh, which was hugely helpful. It was um, kind of our snapshot in time. You know, this is 2019. What does DRIGS look like right now? Um, as far as, you know, population, land use, um, you know, all of our natural resources. How many parks do we have? How many um, linear miles of pathways do we have? You know, all of that kind of nitty gritty stuff. Um, then we launched into uh, public engagement pretty thoroughly. So um, we had a um, really thorough questionnaire that we launched um, in person and online um, and did a really big push for that. And that was a really overarching questionnaire about, you know, what do you need? What do you want? How do you want this city and this area to grow into the future? Um, what are the things that can help you and your family? What are the things that can be done better? Um, it was pretty comprehensive. And we got um, 180 responses, which for a population of dregs, which um, I should have uh, iterated this in the beginning, our population is about 1,800 people. Um, so that response rate was, um, you know, it wasn't everyone, which is too bad, but um, as far as what you can expect to get for um, a survey of this nature, we are pretty excited about it. Um, so we were able to um, Kind of take the information that we learned in that questionnaire and and start to pull out some major themes you know pull out some some visions that started to emerge uh, we did a lot of tabling and just general outreach just to make sure that everyone knew that we were updating the comprehensive plan as much as possible and answer those questions and take feedback um, and just you know let people know that we're here and we're listening um, we went into uh, some high school classes and talked to them and described what planning is and what comprehensive planning is and had those kids actually do the survey um, so that they can have their voice as well. We did one-on-one -on -one interviews with stakeholders um, and that was uh, partially solicited. You know, we had lots of you know, representatives that we wanted to talk to, local business owners, people involved in local nonprofits, um, people in the service industry. 
um, public servants. Uh, you know, we wanted to make sure that we hit all of these different areas, but we also opened it up to anybody. We said, anyone who wants to sign up for a one-on-one -on -one interview, yeah, we'll sit down with you. Let's do it. Um, so that was inc incredibly insightful as well. Um, so kind of after all of this gathering of information, um, we kind of, again, continued to distill this into um, what are the visions that we're seeing kind of emerge from these questions or from these conversations and, and from these responses. Um, with that, we, you know, started drafting what some of these sections might look like. And um, again, bringing that back to the comprehensive plan committee, kind of uh, getting, uh, getting down to the detail of that and refining that. Um, it, so again, we started this in 2019, of course, as everyone knows, March 2020, um, COVID hit. Uh, we were hoping to have the plan adopted in the summer of 2020, um, but when this all happened, we said, well, this is really going to affect our community engagement, right? You know, we're, we, we're not going to be able to hold these meetings and, and ultimately hold the hearings uh, like we had planned to. So. Uh, we, again, plan to or hope to adopt the plan in the summer of 2020. We pressed on the brakes a little bit, so we're going to need a little bit more time to, one, make sure that we're getting all of the engagement that we, that we want to and that we need to, um, and two, to give us a little bit more time to figure out how COVID is going to affect the city of Driggs. Um, when it first hit, and maybe... Uh, um, Bonner County had a shared experience, but it hit in March. Our summer economy in particular is hugely dependent on, on tourism, and we were pretty afraid that that wasn't going to happen at all. Um, so we wanted to give ourselves a little bit more time to see, you know, what the impact of this is. Are, you know, should we, should we change, should we shape the comprehensive plan to address a huge bust? You know, are we going to go into a recession? Um, all of those questions. Um, the summer of 2020 ended up being blockbuster for tourism. So we were able to have a little bit of time to wrap our minds around that. Uh, we were also able to conduct a whole additional survey specifically to COVID. How has it affected you? How has it affected your family? Are you working from home now? Um, you know, do you have access to the healthcare that you need? Focusing on those kinds of questions and say, you know, is, the, is this whole pandemic bringing up a, a blind spot in emergency preparedness and, and healthcare um, in, in our city. So uh, we ended up adopting our comprehensive plan in November, 2020. And um, kind of reflecting on some of the successes and challenges since that time. Um, for one, uh, as I think Bonner County is also experiencing, COVID has brought the Zoom boom to our town as, as we call it. Um, there, we've had a, you know, eyes are on, on Driggs these days. People have noticed us. People have realized that they can um, live here and appreciate our amenities while working remotely, which is not an opportunity that they had before. Um, so we're having a huge, a huge development boom right now. And having an updated plan is just such a relief <laughs> that we're not dealing with a, an older kind of outdated plan from 2007. Um, but that, I guess, COVID has also equally uh, created challenges with the plan, right? Um, part of the plan is the, the actions and the projects that kind of come out of it. The, what Jordan was saying, kind of, okay, we've got this plan. What do we do now? We have to implement it. We have to read the goals of the plan and we have to, we have to do them. Um, with the influx of development, the staff capacity has been pretty much totally dedicated to processing building permits and processing planning and zoning applications. So um, we have struggled a little bit to find the time to really work on those special fund projects that were outlined in the comprehensive plan. Um, but all that to say is that we still have that framework. We still have those goals to work for, so we can always lean on them. Um, Another great success that I think uh, was implemented in our plan um, is that it is specifically, and I guess at this point, now that we've adopted it in my story, I will actually bring up what our comprehensive plan looks like. Um, here's the cover. 
Um, and it, it does start with kind of a background, um, but I'll bring up this table of contents here because you can see how the, the document is organized. Um, and again, I'll point back to the list that Jordan brought up of um, all of the topics that are required by the state of Idaho to be covered in a comprehensive plan. We were able to um, weave a lot of those topics together and kind of um, distill them into um, fewer, fewer chapter, chapters that cover all of those items kind of together. Um, but each of these chapters has, and I'll use the first one, which is uh, residence. Um, so it has an introduction, um, a closer look at health, which is how we tied in the, the health component um, into each, each, each topic. Uh, we have some, some background information, which kind of came out of those existing conditions. Um, collection of information. And then I don't, I hope I'm not giving anyone whiplash by scrolling through, but this is the point that I wanted to get to where each of these topics has a list. Uh, well, first of all, a, a vision statement, and then a list of goals, objectives, and actions. And for each of these actions, we numbered them because we wanted to be able to point very specific very, very specifically to these actions. Um, and these are, these are the pieces of the comp plans that are ideally things that we can, we can run with. We can say, yes, this is what we need to work on right now. What do we need to do to work on this? Um, some of them are, you know, a little bit more crystal clear, a little bit of, uh, some of them are um, kind of a more loose um, action, action statements. Um, but theoretically, all of these statements are actionable. So uh, after we adopted the comprehensive plan, we did a series of work sessions with our city council to say, you know, we just we distilled this document into essentially a list of just the action items. And we said, all right, city council, you know, what should we be working on? What should our priorities be? Um, and with that, staff hope to kind of create a special projects list for ourselves. Um, to dedicate time and, and energy towards. Um, again, unfortunately, with the demand uh, on the development side of things, our capacity to make a ton of progress on these has been a little bit more limited than I would like to see, but we kind of had our marching orders after this. And it's always something that we can revisit. And the plan is to, um, you know, every fall, because that works out, right? We adopted the comprehensive plan in November. Fall is theoretically a slightly slower time for the planning and building department, although we didn't really get that this year um, as the building season starts to wind down. Um, but, you know, hopefully we can kind of bring this back to city council and reiterate this conversation like, okay, here's the, the actions that you all really wanted to focus on last year. You know, here's an update on some things that we have made progress on. Um, and is there anything different? Maybe something is less of a priority now and something else is more of a priority, but we can kind of check in on that point at that point um, and have those conversations. Um, so another um, kind of implementation of the comprehensive plan that is incredibly important is making sure that our land development code is in conformance with our comprehensive plan. Um, so we call it our land development code here, but it is our um, subdivision and zoning ordinance uh, that Jordan was referring to. Um, so it is, a, it is part of our city code of ordinances, um, but we've kind of pulled it out because it does, it's a document that warrants <laughs> looking a little bit different than just typical black and white city code. Um, our code in specific, and specifically um, is you know, pretty well organized, has lots of images to show examples of things. Um, so we have pulled it out. Um, and we have done some code amendments that will bring the code in better conformance to the um, comprehensive plan. Um, so one of those topics is you know, housing and making sure that there is housing available um, at an affordable rate and available to our local workforce. Um, so those are some amendments that we're actually working on right now. Um, we also have looked into things like uh, protections for wildlife and natural spaces and natural resources. 
Um, so again, we've kind of taken some of these actions and said, you know, how can we bring our comprehensive plan into better conformance? Um, the state of Idaho, uh, kind of how, how we generally view the comprehensive plan versus a land development code or, or the, the zoning, zoning ordinance is uh, if, the, if those two documents are not in conformance with each other, the, the zoning ordinance um, trumps essentially. So with planning and zoning um, applications that come down the pipeline, so think uh, subdivisions, uh, zone changes, uh, things like that. If someone is bringing an application to the table that conforms, you know, with the with the zoning code as it is, um, but the comprehensive plan says something else, then you know we likely have to go with what the zoning code says. So it's really the city or the county's duty to bring their land development code or bring their zoning ordinance into conformance with the community vision that's stated in the comprehensive plan in order to make it enforceable. Um, that is kind of my one of my main takeaways, but there are some other ways to look at it as well. So um, I'll bring up another um, piece of our comprehensive plan. So this is our future land use map, and I, I have it here as a separate document. Um, we just kind of pulled it out so it's just a little bit easier to access, but um, this map is within our comprehensive plan. It is our future land use map. So it looks like a zoning map, right? I mean, this is this is the city's zoning map. <laughs> it very much looks like a similar document. But this map, the zoning map, dictates what someone can and cannot do on their property in, in terms of uses, or you know, if they wanted to subdivide it, how big those lots could be, et cetera. Um, the future land use map is taking the vision that we heard through the comprehensive plan process and saying, you know, how should the community develop moving, moving into the future? Some of the biggest differences, you know, one that I'll pull out is um, this area, this downtown, um, kind of the old grid area, as we like to call it, is, you know, single and two family residentially zoned right now. This future land use map calls for a higher density there. So as development proposals, rezone requests come to the table, this is a document that we look at to say, you know, is higher density here where, where this person is proposing it? Is, is it appropriate? Is it in line with what the community wanted to see as far as development patterns? Um, and, you know, it uh, can be a little bit more nuanced than that, but this is kind of the main document that we, that we look at um, to, to help us make those decisions. Um, another kind of softer implementation of the comprehensive plan might be something like a subdivision application, um, which are a little bit trickier. Uh, if someone has a large parcel of land and they're in a zoning district that allows smaller parcels of land, then uh, they're pretty much allowed to subdivide it. Um, but the way that the city and the county can get involved is to say, um, yes, you can subdivide, Yes, here is the minimum lot size. Here are the setbacks. You know, here here's our transportation plan. Here's the roads that you need to put in. Um, but we can also take things out of the comprehensive plan that say, you know, maybe touch more on uh, community character. Um, you know, a desire for trails, a desire for parks in certain locations or of a certain nature. Um, we can point to those actions in the comprehensive plan, and. Uh, work with the developer, um, kind of negotiate with them and say, you know, okay, great. Your goal is to get this many units. And this is the city's opinion or vision of how they should be oriented and organized and, and what kind of amenities um, also need to be, be on the site. Um, so that's kind of how we, how we implement it. But the city, you know, and we get into a tough situation sometimes, and this happens on the county side of things too, where um, someone's allowed to do something in the code, the comprehensive plan would prefer it or would envision it in a different way. But if the, if the applicant doesn't wanna do that, then the comprehensive plan doesn't have very many teeth to make them do it. 
but the zoning code does. So that is really something that needs to be one of the one of the biggest focus focuses after adopting the comprehensive plan is bringing the zoning map and the zoning ordinance and the subdivision requirements um, into conformance with the comprehensive plan. Um, so I want to shift gears a little bit, and I'm actually not sure how I'm doing on timing. Liz, do you know where, where yeah, we are? Um, if you want, uh, you have about five-ish minutes left, according to our original plan, if that works. Great. Cool. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about um, kind of comprehensive planning um, and how that works, you know, with the with a city in inside of a county and and how we work together um, on that. Uh, this future land use map and kind of the scope of our comprehensive plan in general actually goes outside of our city boundary. So um, this white line, hopefully you all can see it. Um, Actually, that's not true, sorry. Uh, the boundary of our city city limits is kind of a, a burgundy thick line right here. Um, so clearly you can see that we are recommending a vision and recommending desired uh, development patterns outside of our city limits. And that is captured within uh, what we have here in the state of Idaho, um, what we call um, area of city impact or area of impact. Um, so this area is subject to an agreement between the city of Driggs and Teton County. Um, and that agreement has both identified the area um, that is included in the area of impact. Um, so on this map, it doesn't, well, actually I'll bring up the zoning map again. It shows it a little bit better. City limits again are this, now it's a black thick line. And it's a little bit unclear, but the area of impact is um, kind of the, the county zones are this brown or tan, and the area of impact um, zones are this kind of lighter green, blue, darker green, um, kind of these colors here. So the city and the county have agreed on this area boundary, and they've also agreed on the zoning in this area, the subdivision standards, the uses, um, and the application process, so the administrative process. This area is technically in the county's jurisdiction, but again, the county has agreed to this uh, area of impact agreement with the city, which states uh, in our case that this area is subject to the city of Driggs comprehensive plan. Um, so that plan will be taken into consideration with um, something like a, a zone change or a conditional use permit or a subdivision. Um, and we also have a joint process. So if a subdivision application, you know, comes to the table in this area, um, the application is actually considered by a joint planning and zoning commission, um, which is a combination of city planning and zoning commissioners and county planning and zoning commissioners um, that convene. Uh, they meet together and they make, make a recommendation on, on the application. Um, one of the great things in our new uh, comprehensive plan that we would like to adopt in this area of city impact is uh, what this white dotted line represents. It's a little bit easier to see up here. Uh, but this is a recommended uh, growth management boundary. Um, so this is, it's roughly based off of what we imagine our city utilities being able to serve, so water and sewer primarily, um, and where we envision um, some higher density being reasonable. Again, look, you know, considering that the comprehensive plan, uh, while it should be updated every 10 or so years, the vision should go much further than that, right? Because anything that's built now is going to be there <laughs> for at least 50 years. Um, so we're really looking at out it like that long. Um, so recognizing that more dense development should happen within this urban growth boundary and then outside should be immediately more rural and less dense. Um, one of the community visions that we heard, community de desires that we heard is kind of preservation of open space, 
um, and having a hard boundary between the city and the county, knowing like, okay, I'm in an urban area right now, I'm in a city and I'm gonna look over there and it is open space and I know that I'm out in the county. Um, that was one, one vision that we heard um, pretty loudly. Um, the other benefit of that is that it provides for much more efficient delivery of, of services, both utilities and services, when everything is in a compact area um, rather than, than spread throughout the county. Um, fortunately, right now, for the most part, um, the city of Driggs and Teton County is generally on the same page of um, promoting growth, um, like dense residential growth and also commercial growth within the city. Um, and, you know, allowing for uh, consistent kind of more, uh, less dense, uh, more rural feeling residential development out in the county um, and preserving open space where we still have it um, and undisturbed areas where we still have it. Um, so with that, that was kind of the topics that I wanted to cover. Hopefully my timing is lining up uh, pretty well. Um, but yeah, I'm happy to share anything else about our comprehensive plan, um, either the process that, you know, any of the takeaways that we had um, and kind of where we're at now with uh, dealing, dealing with all of the development. Awesome. That was great, Leanne, to see kind of how, how that played out in Teton County, Idaho um, and in Driggs and how you guys are moving that, moving forward with it. Um, Thank you. So Jordan and Susan, if you guys want to hop back on, um, we've had some great audience questions come in. Um, I'd also like to introduce uh, Jacob, Jacob Klopfenstein. He is, um, he's also helping us out with his webinar today from the University of Utah. And so he's going to actually be moderating our Q&A session. So Jacob, go for it. Yeah, thanks, everybody. Uh, can you hear me okay? Okay, good. Well, yeah, thanks, uh, Jordan and Leanne. It was really great to have that uh, overview of, of the planning process and then see how it, how it played out uh, in Driggs. Um, so I'd like to start uh, with a question for both uh, Jordan and Leanne. Uh, feel free, either one of you, to, to take this one. Um, when you're going through this, uh, this plan update process in, in your town or county, uh, what's the best way as a citizen to get involved or, or to make your voice heard in that process? I can uh, take that one. Um, you know, I, I recognize that uh, everyone's got their own lives going on and no, you know, it's not every day that you think about what's going on in your county and city government. Um, so I, I try to appreciate that. Um, I would just encourage everyone to just contact someone at at the county office or the, the city office. Um, we're here. I'm, you know, I can speak for myself, but I know generally folks that are in the profession or are in public service um, are are here to help um, and to hear, you know, to do the best job that we can. So just say reach out to someone and say, I don't know who to contact, but I have a question about X, Y, and Z. Or I have a question about the comprehensive plan. Um, and they should be able to send you in the right direction. Um, go in, have a conversation with someone, call them up on the phone. Um, whatever mechanisms the county is using for outreach for the city of Driggs, we have a, a monthly newsletter that I would recommend you subscribe to. Um, you know, it's it's things like that. We can kind of send you on in a direction of, okay, here's how you follow along. But also if you have want to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation, here, here's the person that you should go talk to. Yeah, I'd also echo to um, passing the torch along. So now that you kind of have had this um, overview of planning and are you know thinking about getting in contact with uh, county staff and elected leaders, et cetera, helping other people in your community know about that process too, um, and being able to share that and say, you know, um, like, hey, this is the process that's happening in our community. Would you like to be involved? Um, and then also too, if um, you know, if your city or if your county, um, if they perhaps don't have those kinds of uh, mechanisms in place to do outreach, such as with a newsletter or other things, try to suggest it and say like, hey, we would love to be involved or kind of get information on this. Would it be possible for you to include updates in a water bill or in a newsletter or on the website? Um, and just kind of advocating for that on behalf of yourself and people in your community. Because um, I think it's a really a two-way street 
street too, um, and being able to, to be able to ask and advocate for your own needs as well um, that way. And, and, you know, like Leanne mentioned too, capacity is hard. Um, you know, there's a lot of aspirations and wanting to do a lot of these goals and make momentum go forward. Um, so maybe there are opportunities for there to be volunteers or ways to kind of engage and help with messaging with either your city or county too. Um, and yeah, I just think that there are a lot of lovely ways to, to be able to have that involvement. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think uh, kind of that's one of the things that Project 7B is focused on, kind of sharing the word and, you know, spreading that awareness. Uh, we had some great questions from uh, some of the folks in the chat. Thanks for submitting those. Um, Kate asked, how, how do this Idaho state constitution and state laws affect how local jurisdictions can implement their comprehensive plans? Jordan or Leanne, any thoughts on that? I can take that one too. Um, as far as how uh, we can implement them, um, you know, as long as your comprehensive plan, you know, the, the final document that's adopted, as long as it's not recommending anything that's, you know, otherwise illegal, <laughs> of course, all of these documents should be reviewed by your county attorney first, but as long as all of the, the goals and actions that are stated in there are legal, then, you know, how it's implemented is is really up to um, the the agency, but but also the people. I mean, uh, you know, staff. We do dedicate time towards, you know, reviewing the comprehensive plan, reviewing the, every application against the comprehensive plan, and coming up with recommendations um, about again, like how this application can be made better because of the recommendations in the comprehensive plan. Um, how we can amend our code to be in in better conformance with it. Um, but I, it's a critique on how I'm doing my job, but I absolutely love it when we have a, a public hearing item that's on the agenda and, and we receive a public comment from someone who is familiar with the comprehensive plan and makes a suggestion based on it. It speaks volumes. Um, and again, like, you know, I didn't see it or, you know, we didn't include that, but that's awesome that you saw it that way. And you took a couple minutes to write a letter to city council um, and make a recommendation about how this application can be made better. So, um, yeah, as far as implementation, there's there's tons of different op, um, options to what that actually looks like. Um, but the motivation to do it, especially when staff capacity is low and demand on other things is so high the more we hear about it from other people, the more we hear like, we need to do this. We need to remember this. Um, we, we hear you. And, and that's one of, the, one of the ways that we can keep momentum going. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, next up, uh, this question might be better for, for Susan to answer. Uh, Darcy asks, uh, the county started a comprehensive planning process several years ago and it went nowhere. Um, is this current process uh, starting from scratch or is it just a continuation of, of that previous update process? Hi, I, yeah, I saw there's another question too from Susan Martin about the subcommittee reports. And I think that might be what that other question was referring to because a few years ago, uh, the planning department um, started working uh, or creating these sub area committees uh, the first one was in Sagal, and they had one in Selly Valley. Um, there was Blanchard, Priest. Anyway, they did about five or six. And um, that process really dragged on. And um, and that was sort of, it sort of, I don't know if the intention was to use that as the comprehensive plan update, but it ended up being that the reports from those subcommittees have been um, turned over to what was the Planning and Zoning Commission and now uh, they split the Planning and Zoning Commission into two and now there's a Planning Commission and a Zoning Commission and I believe Don Davis who is on the Planning Commission and was on the previous Planning and Zoning Commission might be on um, you know in the, the webinar today so please put in a chat if I get this wrong Don but um, but my understanding is that those uh, reports that came from the sub area committees are now uh, being used by the planning commission in their update of the comprehensive plan. So um, that was sort of, I guess, the, 
the beginnings of the comprehensive plan rewrite and um, the, the county, now that they've created these two bodies, the planning commission will be focused on the um, county's update. Okay, great, thank you for that. Um, and uh, this next question is a, a little complicated and a little tough, but I think it's a good question. Uh, Jennifer asks, what is the recourse when government bodies don't follow the guidance of the comprehensive plan? So Leanne, Leanne or Jordan, if, if you'd like to weigh in on that. Well, I'm not too familiar with Idaho. That's the hard part for me. Um, as far as, you know, with, with Utah on one hand, um, you know, with our structure, um, there's, uh, we have a requirement, we call it a general plan here. Um, but if it's, um, if it's not necessarily um, aligned with, um, uh, you know, the guidance of the plan, et cetera, it kind of really depends on the, the structure. Um, and so Leanne, I don't know what your experience has been like, and I don't think there is an overseeing body for the state of Idaho that interacts with your comprehensive plans, which also creates a different structure. So like for Oregon, for instance, um, it's really interesting. So theirs is more of a top-down approach where um, if your comprehensive plan is not in alignment with the state standards, you can actually be um, stripped of your local authority uh, until you come into compliance. And so every state is just different um, according to who kind of oversees those requirements and what that structure looks like. But yeah, based on my understanding, Idaho does not have a state um, entity that kind of oversees those. Right, we don't. Um, and how I understand state statute to refer reference this is that um, municipalities, I, I'm not sure how it's worded. I wasn't able to look it up real quick, but like essentially shall bring their zoning ordinance into conformance with the comprehensive plan or, or there's some, some link there. Um, but again, there's no overseeing body. Um, so I guess theoretically, someone could bring issue with this, whether in a litigious way or, or, or else saying, you know, city or county government, you're, you're not doing your job because you updated your comprehensive plan seven years ago and you haven't touched your, your, your zoning ordinance since. You're not doing your job. Um, I don't know if that's actually happened. I don't know what that would actually look like um, in Idaho, but the, the consequence day to day is if our code is not in compliance with that community vision, we can't enforce it. You know, we, if an application comes, comes forward and it's, you know, it conforms with the zoning, <laughs> but the community has already said, we don't like that zoning. We think it should change. There's nothing we can do about it. So that's really, you know, the consequence that development could happen in a pattern that we don't want to see as stated in the comprehensive plan but there's not that much we can do about it. And so then the government, the city government or the county government will get in trouble in that way. Um, you know, they'll, they'll hear about it, so. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, you, uh, Jordan and Leanne, you both talked a lot about uh, community engagement. Um, so Preston would like to know, uh, what are your thoughts on using focus groups uh, to, to solicit input uh, in, a, in the planning process? I love this question. <laughs> um, so something about public uh, participation is that it's a spectrum. Um, and so there's actually a really beautiful, I can include a link to it. Uh, there's a spectrum of participation that was developed by the International Association for Public Participation, otherwise known as IAP2. Um, and essentially it kind of groups up how we think of engagement. And so it goes from um, inform, actually let me screen share real quick, because I think it's really, um, really informative to, be able to see, and I could make it bigger, but I'm not as talented. Um, but over here on the right, um, you see this spectrum right here, and it goes from inform to consult, to involve, to collaborate, to empower. It doesn't necessarily mean that one way is better than the other. It's not saying that inform is, is not as good as empower, et cetera. But what it means is that when we're engaging with people, whether it's focus groups, whether it's a one day workshop, et cetera, it's really important to consider what is the intention with interacting with the public what are you hoping to gather from them and um, how are their responses going to be used in the future, right? So when we think about transparency and trust being diminished, that's, you know, that comment about earlier, right? This process kind of went on a couple of years ago and nothing really happened. That dismantles trust. 
Um, so it's super, super critical for cities, you know, municipalities, um, counties, et cetera, to think about how are they going to involve the public throughout the entire stage of this process? Um, and it could be just in form. It could be having something on the website. It could be the newsletter. It could be something that's really helping people understand what all those phases are. Um, but when you get more into processes like, you know, with involvement and collaboration, et cetera, it can really be an opportunity to have more in-depth conversation with residents um, to really get into here are thoughts and ideas versus like here's choices A, B, and C, which choice would you like? Um, focus groups can really be an opportunity to really kind of brainstorm um, and have more of that depth. It's just really important that those that are part of the focus group are really representative of the community that they're talking about. Um, and so that's a really important consideration to make. And then again, if somebody's going to spend half a day, a full day, et cetera, in a focus group, how is their information and feedback going to be used in this process? Um, that way it doesn't seem like a waste of their time um, and they know that they're being valued for um, the work that they're sharing. But um, I think that if focus groups are intentional, um, they can be really beautiful ways to uh, interact with the community um, and sort of have more of that one on one. And you can do focus groups throughout multiple stages of the project, right? It really depends on is it us forming a community vision? We want to do some focus groups first, or it's we've already compiled all this information. So now we want to bring people in and kind of see if we're missing anything. Um, there's so many different ways that the public can be engaged. Um, and so I think it's just super important to kind of consider, you know, how are you just going to make sure that everyone's informed throughout the entire stage of the process. Um, and that I think is one of the most important pieces. And it's really lovely that, um, um, that you know, Susan and their organization is really striving to um, create that structure and really help to make it more accessible um, because it's, you know, not something that you necessarily know about or, you know, grew up knowing about too. So. Great, thank you. Um, well, we just have a couple minutes left, so uh, we're going to do a, a couple more questions. I, I, unfortunately, I don't think we're going to have time to get to everybody, so I apologize for that. Uh, but thanks for thanks for uh, putting your questions in into the chat. Um, lastly, for for Leanne, uh, Jason would like to know: Does Driggs's comp plan include any sections focused specifically on pr promoting workforce housing or affordability? Yes, it does. Um, so our uh, residence section, which is the one that I used as an example, um, but did kind of gloss over, um, did emphasize our, you know, a community desire to, uh, you know, protect and promote this community. Um, we are, um, Driggs and Victor, for a long time, were considered bedroom communities for uh, the town of Jackson. Um, and, you know, that is shifting a little bit. We do have more kind of independent economies more and more. Um, but a lot of people who live in this valley work um, across the hill or over the hill. Um, so an emphasis on, um, you know, our, our community and helping people that live and work in Driggs and in Teton County, Idaho, uh, live here. Um, so yeah, we have a lot of action items that specifically are designed to to promote um, local workforce and affordable housing. And that ranges from, um, you know, negotiating with developers to the city initiating projects. So we do have a, a LIHTC project, um, a low income housing tax credit project that's coming down the pipeline that the city has been working super hard to, to get off the ground. Um, you know, uh, you know, it's kind of in place before the comprehensive plan, but restating those motivations and and giving uh, staff and, and elected officials, um, you know, the the um, motivation isn't quite the right word, but the backup to work on these special projects um, is super helpful. And um, it's also one of the great reasons why we can, uh, me and the community development director are dedicating a lot of our time these days towards um, an update to our to our land development code. Uh, which will actually require um, some workforce and affordable housing mitigations whenever uh, or most cases when someone brings a zone change and annexation or in some instances a subdivision as well um, so that will all be co codified um, and the demand is you know from current <laughs> events but we're also to, um, able to point to specific action items in the comprehensive plan that say well this is what the community told us to do let's go do it Awesome. That is some, that's 
great to hear what's going on in Driggs, Leanne, and that you guys were able to tap into those, those LITIC credits and things. Um, well, we are about at the end of our time here. Uh, I just wanna say thank you again for everyone who came and spent your afternoon with us, your lunchtime with us. Um, this recording will be posted on um, the, the NAR initiative and the IOR YouTube feed, and it will also be shared on 7B's website, I believe, Susan. Um, yes, we but, hope to do that. Mm -hmm. So as soon as we get that up, that will be shared. Um, we can also send any of the unanswered questions. You guys sent some really good ones in to our panelists. If they have time to answer them, we will include those answers in the written summary with the key takeaways that will also go out in the next few weeks here. Um, so before we go, just a few links in the chat for anyone who wants to learn more about Project 7B, um, the NAR initiative, or that Bonner County story map that Project 7B did, did put on. I also want to just say thank you to our panelists one more time as well. Thank you for taking your the time out of your busy day to share your expertise. It's been an awesome afternoon, and I hope everyone has a great rest of your day. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Bye.